Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. The story of Dracula is not written from a single person's point of view. Instead, we will get lots of different perspectives and writing styles coming together to make a cohesive narrative. Here, we leave Jonathan Harker trapped in Transylvania and turn our attention to his love, Miss Mina Murray, back in England. It's time to pull up a chair, relax and enjoy part four of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 5. Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra. 9th of May. My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you and by the sea where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. I have been working very hard lately because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies and I have been practising shorthand very assiduously. When we are married I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan and if I can stenograph well enough I can take down what he wants to say in this way and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practising very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you, I shall keep a diary in the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sunday squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whatever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day if there is anything in it worth sharing, but it is really an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists doing, interviewing and writing descriptions and trying to remember conversations. I am told that, with a little practice, one can remember all that goes on or that one hears said during a day. However, we shall see. I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be so nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we, I mean Jonathan and I, shall ever see them together. There is the ten o'clock bell ringing. Goodbye. Your loving Mina. P.S. Tell me all the news when you write. You have not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumours, and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. 17 Chatham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote to you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a good deal to picture galleries and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mamma get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is an excellent parti, being handsome, well-off and of good birth. He is a doctor and really clever. Just fancy. He is only nine and twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr Holmwood introduced him to me, and he called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable, I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this on very much with me, but I flatter myself he has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do, and I can tell you it is not a bad study, and gives you more trouble than you can well fancy if you have never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day. There, it is all out. Mina, we have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. We have slept together and eaten together and laughed and cried together. And now... 
Though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write, for although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But, oh, Mina, I love him. I love him. I love him. There, that does me good. I wish I were with you, dear, sitting by the fire, undressing as we used to sit, and I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this, even to you. I am afraid to stop, or I should tear up the letter, and I don't want to stop, for I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, I must stop. Good night. Bless me in your prayers, and Mina... Pray for my happiness. Lucy. P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again. L. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. 24th of May. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains, but it pours. How true the old proverbs are. Here am I, who shall be twenty in September, and yet I have never had a proposal till today, not a real proposal. And today I have had three, just fancy, three proposals in one day. Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself. And three proposals! But for goodness sake, don't tell any of the girls, or they would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas and imagining themselves injured and slighted if in their very first day at home they did not get at six at least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon soberly into old married women, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three, but you must keep it a secret, dear, from everyone, except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, because I would, if I were in your place, certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything, don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are. And women, I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him, Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man with the strong jaw and the good forehead. He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things and remembered them, but he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool. And then, when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him, but when he saw me cry, he said that he was a brute and would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off and asked if I could love him in time, and when I shook my head, his hands trembled, and then with some hesitation, he asked me if I cared already for anyone else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me now, but only to know, because if a woman's heart was free, a man might have hope. And then, Mina, I felt a sort of duty to tell him that there was someone. I only told him that much, and then he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave as he took both my hands in his, and said he hoped I would be happy, and that if I ever wanted a friend I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice and all that sort of thing, but it isn't at all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow, whom you know loves you honestly, going away and looking all broken-hearted, and to know that no matter what he may say at the moment, you are passing quite out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy evening. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off, so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear, number two came after lunch. He is such a nice fellow, an American from Texas, and he looks so young and so fresh, and it seems almost impossible that he has been to so many places and has had such adventures. 
I sympathise with poor Desdemona when she had such a dangerous stream poured in her ear, even by a black man. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears, and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man and I wanted to make a girl love me. No, I don't, for there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories, and Arthur never told any, and yet... My dear, I'm somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't, for Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I helped him all I could. I'm not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say, he never does so to strangers or before them, for he is really well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that it amused me to hear him talk American slang, and whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I'm afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I ever shall speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it, as I have never heard him use any as of yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me and looked as happy and jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his, and he said ever so sweetly, "'Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixins of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you will go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit.' Won't you just hitch up alongside of me and let us go down the long road together, driving in double harness? Well, he did look so good-humoured and so jolly that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr. Seward. So I said, as lightly as I could, that I did not know anything of hitching and that I wasn't broken to harness yet at all. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner, and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so, on so grave, so momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a bit serious too. I, I know, Mina, you will think me a horrid flirt, though I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it that I shall never again think that a man must be playful always and never earnest, because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for he suddenly stopped and said with a sort of manly fervour that I could have loved him for if I had been free. Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl, I know. I should not be here speaking to you as I am now if I did not believe you clean grit right through to the very depths of your soul. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there anyone else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again, but will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend." My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman. I burst into tears. I'm afraid, my dear, you will think this is a very sloppy letter in more ways than one, and I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men, or as many as want her, and save all this trouble? But this is heresy, and I must not say it. I am glad to say that, though I was crying, I was able to look into Mr. Morris's brave eyes and told him out straight. Yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light came into his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine, I think I put them into his, and said in a hearty way, that's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than being in time for any other girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I'd take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he'd better look for it soon, or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more unselfish, anyway. My dear... I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and Kingdom Come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like, for that other good fellow. He must be a good fellow, my dear, and a fine fellow, or you could not love him, hasn't spoken yet. 
I quite won me, Mina, for it was brave and sweet of him, and noble too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he so sad. So I leant over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I'm afraid I was blushing very much. He said, Little girl, I hold your hand, and you've kissed me, and if these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and goodbye. He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back, without a tear or a quiver or a pause, and I am crying like a baby. Oh, why must a man like that be made unhappy when there are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on? I know I would if I were free, only I don't want to be free. My dear, this quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once after telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever your loving Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Because it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both his arms were around me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness to me in sending me such a lover, such a husband, and such a friend. Goodbye. Dr. Seward's Diary Kept in phonograph. 25th of May. Ebb tide in appetite today. Cannot eat, cannot rest, so diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went down amongst the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint that I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today, I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I had ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it, there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seem to wish to keep him to the point of his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patients as I would the mouth of hell. Memorandum. Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Omnia Rome Venelia Sunt. Hell has its price, verb sap. If there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards accurately, so I had better commence to do so. Uh, therefore, R. M. Renfield, a tat fifty nine, sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. A possibly dangerous man, probably dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armour for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is, when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, a cause, etc. is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident or a series of accidents can balance it. Letter, Quincy P. Morris to Honourable Arthur Holmwood, 25th of May. My dear Art, we told yarns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas, and drunk healths on the shore of the Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There will only be one other, our old pal at the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup, and to drink a health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world, who has won the noblest heart that God has made, and the best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome and a loving greeting, and a health as true as your own right hand. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep to a certain pair of eyes. Come. Yours as ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Quincy P. Morris, 26th of May. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both your ears tingle. Chapter 6. Mina Murray's Journal. 24th of July. Whitby. 
Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley, which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scene of part of Marmion, where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin, of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This is, to my mind, the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbour and all up the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour that part of the bank has fallen away and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them through the churchyard and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here very often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit up here and talk. The harbour lies below me, with, on the far side, one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the sea wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end too has a lighthouse. Between the two piers, there is a narrow opening into the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water, but when the tide is out it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the Esk running between banks of sand with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour, on this side, there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp edge of which runs straight out behind the southern lighthouse. At the end of it is a buoy with a bell which swings in bad weather and sends in a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out to sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a funny old man. He must be awfully old, for his face is all gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred, and that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I'm afraid, a very sceptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said very brusquely, "'I wouldn't fash myself about em, miss. Them things be all wore out. Mine. I don't say that they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my time. They be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eating cured herons and drinking tea and looking out to buy cheap jet would creed aught. I one myself who'd be bothering to tell lies to them, even the newspapers, which is full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up and said, I must gang againwards home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to crammy a boon the grease, cause there be a many of em, and miss, I lack belly timber sairly by the clock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead up from the town to the church. There are hundreds of them, I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have something to do with the abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. They will be home by this. 1st of August. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything, and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them, and then takes their silence for agreement with his views. 
Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful colour since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it and put it down. It'll be all full talk, lock, stock and barrel. That's what it'll be, and now else. These bands and wafts and bow ghosts and bar guests and bogles and all them is only fit to set bands and dizzy women a belderin. They be nout but air blebs. They, and all grims and signs and warnings, be all invented by parsons and ilsome buke bodies and railway touters to steer a scanner's halflings and to get folks to do something they don't other incline to. It makes me fretful to think of them. Why, it's them that, not content with printing lies on paper and preaching them out of pulpits, does want to be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here all around you and what art you will. All them stains holding up in their heads as well as they can out of their pride is a cant simply tumbling down with the weight of the lies wrote in them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory, wrote in them all. And yet in nigh half of them there ain't been no bodies at all, and the memories of them been care a pitch of snuff about, much less sacred. Lies, all of them. Nothing but lies of one kind or another. My gog, but it'll be a queer scoutment at the Day of Judgment when they come a-tumbling up in their death sarks, all duped together and them trying to drag their tombstones with them to prove how good they was. Some of them trimlin' and dithering, with their hands that doesn't and slippy from lying in the sea that they can't even keep their group on. Could see from the old fellow's self satisfied air and the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies that he was showing off, so I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Yablins! There may be a poorish few not wrong, saving where they make out the people too good, for there be folk that do think a balm bowl be like the sea, if only it be their own. The whole thing be only lies. Now, look you here. You come here a stranger and you see this Kirk Garth? I nodded, for I thought it better to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on, and you consonate that these stains be a bone folk that happened here and snod and snog. I assented again. Then that be just where the lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these laybeds that be tomb as old Dunn's backer box on Friday night. He nudged one of his companions, and they all laughed. And my gog, how could they be otherwise? Look at that one. The aft is to bust the beer bank. Read it. I went over and read. Edward Spenceley, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April 1854, aged 30. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Who brought him home, I wonder, to hap him here? "'Murdered off the coast of the Andrus, and you consonate his body lay under. "'Why, I could name you a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above,' "'he pointed northwards, or where the currents may have drifted them. "'There be the stains around you. "'You can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. "'This Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, lost in the lively off Greenland in twenty, "'or Andrew Woodhouse, drowned in the same seas in 1777, "'or John Paxton, drowned off Cape Farewell a year later, "'or old John Rawlings, whose grandfather sailed with me, "'drowned in the Gulf of Finland in fifty. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to Whitby when the trumpet sounds? I have me anthrums about it. I tell ye that when they got there, they'd be jumbling and jostling one another that way, that it'd be a fight up on the ice like the old days. We'd be at one another from daylight to dark and trying to tie up our cuts by the light of the aurora borealis. This was evidently local pleasantry, for the old man cackled over it and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, I said, surely you are not quite correct, for you start on the assumption that all the poor people, or their spirits, will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that will really be necessary? Well, what else be they tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. 
To please their relatives, you suppose, he said this with intense scorn. How will it pleasure the relatives to know that lies is wrote over them, and that everybody in the place knows that they be lies? He pointed to a stone at our feet which had been laid down as a slab, on which the seat was rested close to the edge of the cliff. Read the lies on that thrustane, he said. The letters were upside down to me from where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read. Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection on July the 29th, 1873, falling from the rocks at Kettleness. This tomb was erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr Swales, I don't see anything very funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't see any aught funny? <laughs> <laughs> That's just because you don't go on the sorrowing mother was a hellcat that hated him because he wasn't a crooked, a regular lamater he was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide in order that she mightn't get an insurance she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket that they had for scaring the crows with. Twant for crows then, but for it brought the Cleggs and the Dabs to him. That's the way he fell off the rocks. And as to hopes of a glorious resurrection, I've often heard him say, Mazel, that he hoped he'd go to hell, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now, isn't that stain at any rate? He hammered it with his stick as he spoke. A pack of lies. And won't it make Gabriel cackle when Geordie comes panting up the grease with this tombstone balanced on his hump and asks for it to be looked at as evidence? Did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up, Oh, why did you tell us all this? It is my favourite seat and I cannot leave it, and now I find I must go on sitting over the grave of a suicide. That won't harm you, my pretty, and it may make poor Geordie gladsome to have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt you. Why, I've sat here on and off for nigh twenty years past, and it hasn't done me no harm. Don't you fash about them as lies under you, or that doesn't lie there neither. It'll be time for ye to be getting scat when you see your tombstones all run away with, and the place as bare as a stubble field. There's the clock. I must be going. And my service to you, ladies. And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat, and she told me all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That just made me a little heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day. I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town, sometimes in rows where the streets are and sometimes singly. They run right up the Esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleating in the fields away behind me, and there is a clatter of donkey's hoofs up the paved road below. The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time, and further along the quay there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. Neither of the bands hears the other, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr Seward's Diary 5th of June. The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He had certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate, and to my astonishment he did not break out into a fury, as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and then said, "'May I have three days? I shall clear them away.' Of course, I said that would do. I must watch him. He has turned his mind now to spiders, and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them with his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished, although he has used half his food in attracting more flies from outside to his room. 1st of July. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. 
He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must clear out some of them at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much well with him, for when a horrid blowfly, bloated with some carrion food, buzzed into the room, he caught it, held it exultantly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and, before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting down something. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up in batches, and then the totals added in batches again, as though he were focusing some account, as the auditors put it. 8th of July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon. And then, oh, unconscious mind, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remain as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, ever, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. 19th of July. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and he said he wanted to ask me a great favour, a very, very great favour, and as he spoke he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, a kitten, a nice little sleek playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity, but I did not care that his petty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and the spiders, so I said I would see about it, and asked him if he would rather not have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, "'Oh, yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten, lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they?' I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden fierce sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10pm. I have visited him again and found him sitting in a corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word and sat down gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning, early. 20th of July. Visited Renfield very early, before the attendant went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and beginning it cheerfully and with a good grace. I looked around for his birds, and not seeing them, asked him where they were. He replied, without turning around, that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there were anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took and ate them raw. 11pm. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make even him sleep, and took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind— I shall have to invent a new classification for him and call him a zoophagus life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a sufficient cause— 
Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I even the secret of one such mind? Did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanderson's physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing, if only there were a sufficient cause. I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too be of an exceptional brain congenitally? How well the man reasoned. Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one. He has closed the account most accurately, and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me, it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. If I only could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good, unselfish cause to make me work, that would indeed be happiness. Mina Murray's Journal, 26th of July. I am anxious, and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time, and there is also something about the shorthand symbols that makes it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time and was very concerned, but yesterday dear Mr Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenra has got an idea that sleepwalkers always go out on roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened and fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear. She is naturally anxious about Lucy, and she tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, that he would get up in the night and dress himself and go out if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning out her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathise with her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Homewood, he is the Honourable Arthur Homewood, only son of Lord Godalming, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat of the churchyard cliff and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27th of July. No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should, I do not know, but I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot that she cannot yet get cold, but still the anxiety and the perpetually being wakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She has lost that anemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3rd of August. Another week gone, and no news from Jonathan, not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he is not ill. He surely would have written— I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, and yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. 
Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep she seems to be watching me. She tries the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6th of August. Another three days, and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to, or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a grey day, and the sun as I write is hidden in thick clouds, high over Kettleness. Everything is grey, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it. Grey earthy rock, grey clouds tinged with the sunburst at the far edge hang over the grey sea, into which the sand points stretch like grey fingers. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with the roar, muffled in with the sea mists drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a grey mist. All is vastness. The clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brule over the sea that sounds like some presage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home too, and rise and dip in the groundswell as they sweep into the harbour, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine and asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine, I'm afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I've been a-saying about the dead, and such like, for weeks past, but I didn't mean them, and I want you to remember that when I'm gone. We old folks be that daffled, and with one foot abaft the crock hole, don't altogether like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scared of it, and that's why I've took to making light of it, so that I'd cheer up my own heart a bit. But, Lord love you, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit. Only, I don't want to die, if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand now, for I be old, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect, and I'm so nigh it that the old man is already witting his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffin' about it all at once. The chaffs will wag as they be used to. Some day soon the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye duel on greet, my dearie, for he saw that I was crying. If he should come this way this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waitin' for something else than what we're doing, and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's a coming to me, my dearie, and coming quick. It may be coming while we be looking and wondering. Maybe it's in that wind out over the sea that's bringing with it loss and wreck and sore distress and sad hearts. Look, look, he cries suddenly. There's something in that wind and in the host beyond that sounds and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it coming. Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes. He held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me, and said goodbye, and hobbled off. It all touched me, and upset me very much. I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. "'Can't make her out,' he said. "'She's a Russian, by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way.' She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open or to put in here. Look there again. She has steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel, changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow.
and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part four of Dracula. If you would like to support The Well-Told Tale, the best way to do that is on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next time with part five. I hope you can join me.